As you're turning to Romans 7, we begin a few weeks here in this chapter. And while we're beginning a, a new chapter here in Romans 7, Paul is actually not beginning a new section. In Romans 7, especially here the, verse, the first six verses, which will be our passage today, Paul has one more point to make about our union with Christ before he moves on to another topic there in verse 7. And in general, we can characterize the, the teaching of Romans 6 and Romans 7 as follows. In Romans 6, all the way to chapter 7, verse 6, Paul shows us that God's grace leads to holiness. People had tried to say, Paul, if you teach that we're saved by grace and we don't have to do anything, then people are going to think they can live in sin. And so Paul takes chapter 6 and then up into chapter 7 to basically say that's not the case. God's grace leads to holiness. And then beginning in verse 7, all the way through the end of chapter 7, 7 chapter 7, verse 7 through verse 25, Paul shows us that God's grace does not mean that believers will no longer struggle with sin. So God's grace doesn't mean sin doesn't matter. No, nope, God's grace leads to holiness. But God's grace doesn't lead to a perfect holiness. So there's two ways we can sort of go off track, and Paul wants to address both of those and give his argument of why they are not true. So in chapter 6, Paul is responding primarily to the problem of those who think that teaching that we're saved, accepted by God by faith, He's saying that doesn't mean we can do as we please. That's what he's, he's dealing with that, that false teaching. We often hear that in our own day where people will say, well, I'm a believer now and the law has nothing to do with me. Or some are a little more bolder and they will say, you know what, I'm a believer now and it doesn't matter how I live. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. And Paul says, when you say that, you've misunderstood what I'm teaching. That is not what salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone means. And then in chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, he deals with the problem of those who think that because we are no longer under the law and under grace, that our past break with sin is so complete and it is so decisive that we will no longer struggle with sin as Christians. This is often referred to those who have a perfectionist teaching or called the higher life teaching a long time ago, and there's still some elements that stick around. That we, are, we do have victory over sin in this life, but it is not a complete victory over sin. And some will teach that if you have really reached the, 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 the epic center of the Christian life, then you will not struggle with sin. And Paul makes clear there at the end of chapter 7 that that is not, that is not true. So with that in mind... Hopefully you understand a little bit better of where we're at as we come here. I want to read our passage this morning, Romans chapter 7, picking up in verse 1 through verse 6. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh... Our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. You would join me in prayer as we ask God's blessing on the reading and the preaching of His Word. Father, we come this morning and we are thankful for the faithfulness and the truthfulness of Your Word. And Father, we are thankful for the help that it provides for us to follow You in this life. And Father, we ask that as we've read Your Word, as we spend the next few moments together thinking on its truth and the implications it has for our lives, Father, we pray for the aid of Your Spirit to guide us, to teach us, to uh, give us a mind that can comprehend what is said here, and Lord, to give us a will, a desire 
to do what it says, to believe what it says. Father, we know that the believing and the doing are gifts from You. We cannot produce them. And so we ask, Lord, bless us by the presence of Your Spirit to take Your Word and to create Your church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Knowledge is power, right? Do you believe that? Is it true? Well, see, Seth, it has to be true. It was on Schoolhouse Rock, right? They don't lie to us on Schoolhouse Rock. But when we think about that statement, knowledge is power, like many things in life, there is some truth to that, that if you know something that someone else doesn't, it gives you an edge on them. It can give you power in the business world. It can give you power in the classroom. You're going to get a better grade. You're going to be able to answer the questions that the teacher puts forward to you. But there are some things that knowledge doesn't necessarily equal power particularly in the spiritual world, just knowing what God requires, don't do this and do this, that knowledge does not give you or equal power to do what God says or to avoid what God says. And because many Christians, many preachers, many churches have taken this idea that knowledge equals power, and therefore, if you need power to overcome sin, you need to know what is right and what is wrong. And if you have that knowledge, you have all that you need. And this has caused many people to reject Christianity because they think they have tried Christianity and it didn't work. They had a knowledge of what they needed to do, but they were not able to execute, and therefore Christianity is not true. Or there are those who continue to believe in the gospel, but they live the Christian life defeated and experiencing no victory over sin in their life because they think all they need to overcome sin is a knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. Knowledge does not equal power to overcome sin in the Christian life. So if you're here this morning and you're a Christian who has sort of given up the fight against sin because you don't seem to be making any progress, you're not really bearing fruit for God, then we have something here this morning to help you see really two barriers that prevent you from bearing fruit for God. If you're here this morning and you're burdened by weariness, even a weariness to the point of despair in trying to work for God's acceptance of you. You're trying to get God to forgive you. You're trying to sort of turn over a new leaf. Then there's good news for you in this passage. And even if you don't realize that you're trying to earn the favor of God by how you act and live and how you speak and treat other people, Paul, in this passage, has some good news for you. And if you will pay attention to what he says, it will change your life. On the other hand... You may be here this morning and you're not at all burdened by your sin. You don't have a sense of inadequacy before the Lord. As a matter of fact, you think you're doing fairly well and that you could commend yourself to God apart from Jesus Christ. And if you're in that position, then Paul doesn't really have some good news for you this morning. He has some threatening news for you in this passage. And even if you don't realize that you're doing this, that you think you're good enough to commend yourself to God, Paul is going to say some things this morning that will challenge your whole way of viewing your life. And hopefully, that will lead to the, your change in your own thinking. What I want to do this morning is sort of set the context. If we're not careful. We've looked at the book of Romans a couple of times over the past couple of years. And if we're not careful here, it's sort of like inviting you to sit down to a game of cards that's four or five rounds through the game and you're taking over someone's place, and you look at the, the, the hand of cards that you have, and you don't know what's been played, what's happened beforehand. And so, hopefully by setting a little bit of the context here, it'll get a, you a better feel for where Paul's at in his argument. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I think it will be beneficial for us to set the context. And I want to do specifically do this by looking first very closely at our passage first. And we really see three divisions in today's passage. There in verse 1, there is a principle that is stated. Paul just states a principle. And then in verses 2 and 3, he gives an illustration. So he illustrates the principle by referring to marriage. And then in verses 4 through 6, he stated his principle, he has illustrated his principle, then he applies that principle 
to us as believers, as Christians, and particularly showing us how it affects our relationship to the law, to the Ten Commandments. Then we, we notice that outside of this passage, as I mentioned at the beginning, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 is really a continuation of an argument that Paul has already been making where he is provided, he is providing three illustrations of what it means to be united to Christ. If you go all the way back to chapter 6, verse 1, Paul begins this discussion by starting this discussion about our union with Christ by talking about an illustration of baptism. In verses 1 through 14, he refers to baptism as an illustration of what it means to be united by Christ. He says, What then shall we say, verse 1, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We're united with Christ, result, new life. We're going to live in a different way. We're not going to use God's grace as an excuse to sin. Because of God's grace, we begin a new way of living. And he references baptism as a means of illustrating what that is. Then in, in chapter 6, verse 15, he moves on to his second illustration. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? He's used the illustration of baptism. Then he uses this illustration of slavery. He's saying if you submit yourself to sin, if you do what sin tells you to do, then you're a slave of sin. You're still enslaved, and yet... We're not. We're slaves of righteousness. We're slaves to obey what God has called us to do. And then, as we arrive in chapter 6, Paul picks up and he describes that our union with Christ, we have been united with Christ like baptism, we have been united with Christ as His slave, and now he says that our union with Christ is like a marriage. We're married and bound to the law. We have obligations to the law, but we've been freed from that, and now we have a new husband. We have Christ. And so each of these illustrations will helps, help us understand a little more clearly what it means to be united with Christ. And again, our main focus here being on the one mentioned marriage in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 7. So then I want to take you even a further step back in looking all the way back to chapter 5 in the book of Romans. And what we want to do here is see the three implications of justification by grace through faith. That is, that we are declared acceptable before God, not based on things that we do, but based on God's grace. Just God's kindness to us to accept those who will trust in Him. And in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says that one of the implications of justification by faith is peace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, not by works, we have peace with God, right? If we were justified by works, we could never have peace with God because are we ever doing enough, right? But because our justification is not based on our performance but on God's grace, we experience peace with God. Then, carrying on into chapter 6, Paul says that because we have, we've been justified by faith, we have holiness because of God's work of grace in our lives. One of the implications of being justified freely by the death of Christ is that we are made to be what God intended us to be by the grace of God. God intends for us to be holy, and by God's grace, He will make us obedient. He will make us righteous. So we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness. That was Paul's argument there in verses 15 through 23 of Romans chapter 6. And then we finally come to our passage today in Romans chapter 7. Paul says that one of the implications of our justification is freedom. Because we are justified by faith alone apart from the law, apart from our obedience, then one of the implications of that is what we experience freedom. Now we've been waiting for Paul to talk about freedom for some time as you work through this book especially after he uses this imagery of slavery, not something that we associate with freedom, and he finally gets there. 
And in verses 1 through 6, he elaborates on what type of freedom that we actually have. That we are free from the law as the way in which we relate to God and the way that we progress in the Christian life. Or as I put it there in the big idea, through Jesus' death, we have been freed from the law and now we are able to bear fruit for God. So long as we were bound to the law, we couldn't bear fruit for God. We, we bore sin. We bore death. That's what the law produces. But now that we are freed from the law, we are able to marry another, namely Jesus. And because of our union with Christ, we are able to bear spiritual fruit. Through Jesus' death, we have been freed from the law, and now we are able to bear fruit for God. And that leads us here to looking at the two barriers in this passage that exist that prevent us from bearing fruit for God. The first barrier that prevents us from bearing fruit for God is when we view or by viewing the law as a solution. If you view the law as a solution to your issue with sin, your battle with sin, you will not bear fruit for God. It's the wrong tool. In verse 1, Paul gives us that principle that I mentioned earlier. I want to read that. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, he's speaking to the Christians in the city of Rome, Jews, and then the Gentiles that belong to that congregation would have most likely been God-fearing Gentiles. Gentiles who became Jews, and then when the gospel preached, those Gentiles believed in Christ. And so they were familiar with the law. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Right? You can go out to a graveyard, and there's someone there that committed a crime, and you can condemn that person that's buried in the ground. But the law has no power over that person, right? Because the person's dead. The only reason, the way the law would have a power over someone who broke the law is if the person was still alive. Once they die, the law and its condemnation is broken over that person. And so Paul gives that principle. He's telling us that as as long as you are you are un, as long as you're alive, you're under the law. It has a permanent jurisdiction over your life. And because we have violated that, its permanent relationship to us is one of condemnation. The law stands in front of us and it condemns us. You have broken the law. You have not done as God told you you ought to do. That's what the law's job is. It just stands there saying, you messed up. You didn't do what you ought to do. It's the law's job. We can't hate the law for that reason. Matter of fact, Paul later on in verse 12 of chapter 7 says that the law is holy and righteous and, and honorable. It's a good thing. That's just the job that God gives to it. So the law is not our solution. It's not the solution to our problem of sin. It's not the solution before we know God, that this sin has separated us from God. And once we become Christians, the law is not the solution for dealing with that indwelling remaining sin that we still battle with. To put it in a crude way, Paul wants us to understand that the law is not our go-to guy, right? Any championship caliber team, whatever sport it is, you're going to have somebody on the team that when, when everything's on the line, you want to get the ball to that person. They're going to make the play. They're going to deliver. And as Christians, or even as non-Christians, there's a temptation within Christianity to look to the law as the law is going to come through for us. That's how we can get to God. We just got to do what God says. Or even as a Christian, the way I'm going to overcome this indwelling sin is we got to look to the law to help us get over this, this indwelling sort of habitual sin that's in our life. The law is not the go-to guy. We cannot view the law as the solution to our problem of sin. Now as we think about this, This first principle, that you are under the law as long as you live. And by doing so, Paul is reminding us again that the law, any law, is not a solution because it is part of the problem for us. Because we have violated the law. The law says, do this or you will be cursed. And we didn't do it. Or if you do this, you will be cursed and we did the thing that we ought not to do. So the law can't be a solution because every person, every human being, apart from the Lord Jesus, has violated the law. So it's foolish for us to look to it as a as sort of a a helper. And not only that, not only we violated it, 
But the law is a permanent jurisdiction over us. So that we have violated this law, and this law is always binding on us as long as we live. We're bound to it. And so Paul is making clear to us, once again, the law cannot be a way of escape. It cannot be a way back to a restored relationship with God, and it cannot be a way for us, once we are restored to God, to progress in the Christian life in overcoming sin. Now in verses 2 and 3, Paul uses an, gives the illustration of marriage to illustrate the principle that he's made, and he uses this, again, as I said, marriage. We are just as morally bound by the law as a bride is legally tied to her husband. That's what he says. Notice there in verse 2. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. Right? As long as her husband's alive, the law has a permanent jurisdiction over her marriage. You must remain married to him. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Once death happens, the law's contract, the law's power is broken. Then he goes on to say, accordingly... She will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Now, there are really two things here we need to consider about this illustration. First of all, this illustration is very complex. When you read it here, he starts off talking about a woman who is joined to a man, and he speaks of the husband dying, and then the, wa- the wife is then freed from the marriage But then when you get to verse 4, he applies the illustration. He speaks as though the woman has died. Uh, And and then it it just becomes a very confusing thing. And Paul has to sort of basically not make a 100% correlation between this analogy of marriage and the analogy of our marriage to Christ, our union with Christ. And he has to mix some things up when he when he tries to bring this illustration over and apply it to us because there are differences between our union with Christ and our union with someone on the earth. There are differences there. Not only that, he sort of uses this illustration in verse 4. He says, Likewise, my brothers, you have also died. So in this relationship with Christ, we're viewed as the bride, as the wife, whereas in the illustration, the wife didn't die, the husband did. So it can get a little bit confusing as you think about that. And therefore... Paul alters this, and, and that's the why he does it, because he's, it's not a complete 100% correlation between union with a spouse and union with Christ. The other thing that we need to recognize about this illustration is that Paul is not talking about every case that he can bring up with regard to marriage. A lot of times people, especially as I saw different people trying to teach on this passage, it's just like, guys, you're missing the forest for the trees here. And they get all caught up on, the, is this permanent view of marriage and all this other stuff. Paul's point here isn't to give a theology of marriage. He's using marriage as an illustration for a bigger point. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here and get sidetracked about what Paul's talking about marriage because that's not his point. A lot of times we get off into error when we read the Bible that way. Paul is speaking of a general circumstance that generally speaking, marriage is, and the law of marriage means it is a lifelong commitment. It is a permanent vow that is made. And so Paul's saying, take this as an example of me showing you that the law is always binding of you as long as you live. And here's the example. This woman can't go marry someone else as long as that relationship is intact and her husband is alive. As long as you live, you are tied to the law just as this bride is tied to her husband. And you are under its jurisdiction just as this bride and this husband is under the jurisdiction of the law of marriage. And this relationship says, do this with the law, do this and you live. To the woman it was saying, remain married to him and you're okay. If you leave him, you're an adulteress. There's going to be curse upon you. And so Paul's using that as the illustration. And if you think about it, this is an interesting point that Paul's setting up. He's saying, look, you were married to the law. You had a relationship with the, this marriage was a, a marriage that was demanding. Your spouse was critical of you, constantly pointing out where you've fallen short, where you need to improve, what you need to do better about. And on top of all that, everything that that, that husband said to you, the law was right about it. Critical, demanding, restrictive. 
and 100% right. That was the relationship that we have. And Paul's saying as long as you live, that's your relationship that you have with the law. It's over. You You can't undo it. You can't use the law as a means of getting right with God or continuing with God because you've already violated it. It's not a way back to God. It's not a way back home into His family. So that's one barrier. Viewing the law as a solution. Hopefully you see here, Paul's making the point. The law is binding on a person as long as he lives. A married woman's bound just like this. He uses marriage illustration. And unless you die, you will always be married to the law. The second barrier is when we ignore your new freedom purchased by Jesus' death. When we ignore our new freedom that has been purchased by Jesus' death. He says this in verse 4 through 6. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. So you, 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 the relationship with the law produced sin and death. It didn't enable you to bear fruit for God. And you can't get out from the law unless you die. And then Paul says, that's good news. You have died. You as Christians have died to the law through the body of Christ. Because you're united to Christ, you die with Christ. You Back to earlier to chapter 6, you've died with Christ, you were buried with Him in His death, and raised to new life in His resurrection. So you've got this union with the law that doesn't produce spiritual fruit for God. It's a sterile morality. And Paul says, you, but, but you can't get free from the law unless a death happens. Just like that woman can't get free to marry another man unless a death happens. And Paul says, the good news is you have died. And as a result, you have been released from the law. So that you may belong to a mother, another. Now that you've died to the law, you're free to remarry. And who are you going to be remarried to? To him who has been raised from the dead. You're going to be married to Christ, union with Christ. And what will be the result of this new union with Christ since you've been broken off your marriage with the law? He says there in the verse 4, in order that you, we may bear fruit for God. Our union with the law didn't produce any spiritual fruit. It didn't honor the Lord. But now that we've died with Christ, we've been united and married to Christ, and the result of our union with Christ is that we bear much fruit for God. It's a new relationship. Jesus comes with the same standards of the law. Jesus doesn't say, oh, you don't have to worry about what the law said. No, no, no. no. The only difference is Jesus, in the marriage with Jesus, He brings mercy. He brings forgiveness. There's a way for our failures and our shortcomings to be dealt with in a way that honors God, not swept under the rug, and not just simply building up and piling up as it was with the law. The law had no way to deal with our breaking of the law. Christ comes in and says, I will bear the judgment that your breaking of the law requires so that we might live in a harmonious marriage. That's the new relationship. He goes on to say, For while we were living in our flesh, that is, talking about living in in a sinful way, he goes on to elaborate that, with our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So apart from knowing God, when we were left in in our old nature, our own sinful nature against God, when the law came, the law simply aroused sin. It stirred up. It told us, don't do that. And and when we hear something, don't do this, or we're told to do something, we naturally go, I don't want to do that. Our sinful passions come up and say, that's not who I am. I'm going to be who I am. I'm not going to be told how to do. And Paul's saying, that's what happened. Before we knew Christ, our sinful passions, when the law came and said, don't do this, be this way, it, it, it aroused sin. And what the result of that was that was working in our own body was the fruit of death. Not fruit for God. But now, verse 6, something's happened. When we died with Christ, when we trusted in Him for the forgiveness of our sin, we died to ourselves so that we might live for Christ, we were released from the law. Having died to that which held us captive, which bound us, now, because we've been freed from that, we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So having given us this illustration, Paul brings home the point as we've just read. And he really basically tells us three things about ourselves. That we have died to the law, that we belong to Christ, and that we now serve in the Spirit. 
For those of you here this morning that have believed on the Lord Jesus, you have stopped trusting in yourself, you've stopped trusting in your own good deeds and your own saying the right thing and behaving the right way. You've stopped trying to commend yourself to God by how you live. You've stopped trying to purchase or sort of cajole God into accepting you or offering His forgiveness to you. And instead, you've just thrown yourself on His mercy to say, Lord, I don't deserve your forgiveness. I don't deserve your kindness. I don't deserve your grace. But Father, I am asking that you would extend it to me because of Christ's work on the cross for me. If, you, if you've done that, then you are no longer bound to the law. The law is no longer your husband. You've died, and now you're married to Christ. And the way to bear fruit with God is not to try to go back and have a relationship with the law. It's to reflect on the relationship you have with Christ, which will empower you and enable you to keep the law. That's his point. You have died to the law. It's no longer your master. And so you don't look to it as a way to earn God's favor, to initially become a Christian, and as a Christian, you don't look to the law as a means of keeping your favor with God. You have favor with God because you are married to Christ. Period. Not because you had a good quiet time this morning. Not because you didn't lose it with your husband this week. Not because your kids have done all the things that you've told them to do. You have acceptance with God because you're united with Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the beloved and acceptable Son of God. Now, when you have that stature, and you understand that's true about you, then you're able to not get despaired and downtrodden when you do sin. You recognize, I'm accepted because of Christ's work, not my performance. And because I'm united with Christ, I can and I must bear fruit for God. We don't go back to the law. The law is not a solution to our problem. Not only have we died to the law, but now we belong to Christ. We're united to Christ. We have a new husband. And our new husband is the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we serve the Lord in a new way. As we saw there in verse 4, Paul writes, "...so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God." And then in verse 6, we have released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Paul is telling us that Christ's death, and as a believer, your death with Him, has brought us new freedom. We are freed from the condemnation of the law. The law can no longer condemn us because the law can't condemn Christ. He kept it perfectly, and we're in Christ. And so we have His reputation. It is ours. It can't condemn us. And that is an encouragement part. And because it, can, it can't condemn us because our union with Christ is till death do us part. And because you died in your union with Christ, you and us, you and I have died, and because Christ died to, in our place, the power of the law and the jurisdiction of the law has been broken over us. So not only can the law no longer condemn us, the law can, never, can no longer hold us back. We're not in, in slavery to it. It's not a taskmaster for us. Now, I want to be clear here. The commandments are not evil. Right? In verse, tw in verse 12, Paul says, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The, the problem is not the commandments. The problem is when we view the commandments as a means to bring us life. God did not give the commandments as a way to bring us life. And whether you're here and you're not a Christian, and you might think that that's what Christianity is, that you're here and you say, I just need to get my act together, I need to clean up my life, I just need to turn over a new leaf, what do I need to do? Don't look to the law. I, when I was down in Alabama, a lot of the stuff with Judge Roy Moore was brought up, if you're familiar with that whole saga, which is just another black eye in Alabama. But needless to say, people would just be around, when you get the Ten Commandments back in the schools, and I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? The law does not create fruit for God. The Ten Commandments are not going to turn the school system around. The Ten Commandments are not going to turn the church around. Union with Jesus bears fruit for God. The Ten Commandments stir up sin, arouse sinful passions, help people know they're sinners, yes, and good and right that we need that. It's not the solution. The commands are good. 
but they don't bring life. The commandments don't change us. In fact, when we are unbelievers, the commandments create within us death. Now think about this. We all counsel other people. We all hear people share their problems and we talk to them about what the Scripture says or we give some advice. Maybe it's just something we've heard on the news or something. But th one thing that we do when we counsel people is we're telling them what we think they should do. Oh, you tell us you got this situation going at work. Well, here's what I think you ought to do, yada, yada, yada. We give them instructions. And that's a good and right thing that we ought to do when we're counseling people. But Paul here reminds us of a fundamental truth. The commands alone never change anyone. you got to get this. Most of the people that we counsel already know what they ought to do. You think about your own life and the own struggles that you have, the issue is not an ignorance of what you ought to do. God says to do this, you know that. As a matter of fact, if somebody comes up to you and they hound you over and over and over again, well, you know what this is the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, do you know this is what you ought to do? And very quickly, you're going to grow frustrated with that person. I know! Stop it! Maybe that's just me. I don't like people doing that to me. I know what I ought to do. So most of the time, people already know. And there's a time and place where we need to remind ourselves of what the Scripture says. But we have to remember, when we are reminding people this is what the Scripture says, that reminder itself, by itself, cannot give that person the power to do it. This is where so many churches go wrong, so much interaction with other human beings, so much parenting, it all goes wrong here, because they don't get this. They think that our instruction in the law can produce the fruit of God, and it cannot. That's not what the law was given to do. Again, there's a time and place for that instruction, but you've got to know why you're doing it. Now, as I said, that doesn't mean that when we say something to someone that it's a wrong thing to say. If we're saying the Scripture, we're saying the commands, that's a good and right thing to say. We just have to understand it's not going to change someone. Early in my ministry, when I began, began I just thought, man, everyone's problem, they just need to hear what i got to say. If they'll just listen to me preach this sermon on this passage, they're going to leave here, and they know what to do, and it's going to be perfect. And then I started dealing with people, and then I started dealing with my own life. And realizing, Seth, you know, you know what you ought not do. You know what you ought to do. But you don't do it. If I can, right, if I, if I can just meet with this person individually, if I can just sit down and help them, just help them to understand what's going on inside them, which is what a lot of counseling is. And then if I can help them see what they ought to do, then they'll change. But understanding what is happening to you and how it will get better is a good thing, but it doesn't give you the power to change. It doesn't. The Holy Spirit must come and use those exhortations in order for change to take place. And even then, it comes down to an issue of motivation. And that's why Paul then in verse 6 says, But now, right? While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bring bear fruit for death. But now, we are released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the code. There's been a great change. Something's happened. The old you has died, and there's been a new creation. There's been a new spiritual birth that's taken place not because of something you've done, but by the gracious act of God in your life. And because of that new creation, you serve in a new way. Your relationship to God is totally different. You're not viewing the law as a means to climb up to God. You know you've been accepted by God because of God's grace, and now you have a love for God, and you want to know, how do I love God? And the law says, this is how. This is not how you earn God's love, but this is the way you can love God. Do these things. And you do those things because you love God, not because you're trying to earn His love. It's an entirely different dynamic in how we approach it. When we die with Christ, the law's hold over us was broken, and we were released from what we call the Old Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant wasn't evil, it wasn't legalistic, it was a gracious covenant, but it was temporary. And it did not possess the same power that the New Covenant that Christ has purchased in His blood possesses. The Spirit did not indwell in every person in the Old Covenant, but now, in the New Covenant, God's Spirit dwells in all of us. We're all full of God's Spirit. And so Paul uses this comparison between the newness of the Spirit and the oldness of the written code or, or the, the letter. 
He does it in chapter 2 of this same book, in Romans chapter 2, verse 29. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, from but God. And then later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul giving a little bit further instruction. He's talking about the kind of ministry he has. He says in verse 6 that, that God has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And so Paul says, because we've died to this old ministry of the law, of the written code, now we have this new ministry of the Spirit. You see, only the Spirit can transform us. Only the Spirit can release us from the law. And here's how the Spirit does this. The Spirit does use God's instruction to tell us what is right and wrong. That's its place. But the law itself can't change us. So how does the Spirit change us? The Spirit changes us by reminding us of our new relationship with Christ. When you're facing sin, it is good and right to know, you know what, what I'm being asked to do by this, in this temptation, that's wrong. You need to know that, all right? But that knowledge alone is not power to overcome sin. In that moment of temptation, you not only need to know what's right and wrong, that's a knowledge, but you also need to be reminded that you're no longer the same person, that you've been baptized with Christ. You've been raised to newness of life. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to Christ. You're no longer married to the old written code of the law. You've got a, you belong to a new husband, Jesus. Reminding yourself, this is what the Spirit does, reminding us of our relationship with Christ. When we're asked to do something, that's not who I am. Not only does God say not to do it, that's true, but that's no longer who I am. I'm, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I've been baptized with Christ. I, I've been divorced from the law, and I've been, I belong to Jesus now, and, and belonging to Jesus, I don't do that. See, that's different. It's an identity thing that our identity is in our union with Christ. And as the Spirit reminds us of that, it empowers us. It motivates us to say, I'm going to do what God says to do, and I'm going to avoid what God says not to do. Now, when you think about that in relationship to your spouse or to your kids or to any other relationship you have, as we think about that as elders or anyone in church leadership, I think about this all the time, that when you're trying to help people do what's right, they do need to know what's right, but more importantly, it comes down to an issue of motivation. And the best way to get God's people to do what they ought to do isn't by telling them the law over and over again. It's by pointing them and reminding them, this is who you are. And because of this is who you are, you know what to do. The motivation develops. And in that moment, you're having to trust the Lord. You're having to rely on the Lord to use His Spirit to work with His Word in the hearts of His people. Whether that's change you want to see in your husband's life, whether that's transformation you want to see in the people in your community group, or that obnoxious neighbor who's, a, who's not yet a believer. You know the ultimate thing there is not that they need the law. Either they need their heart changed and be united with Christ for the first time, or they need to be reminded anew and anew of their identity in Christ. And when they're reminded of that, then they're, in, they're able to bear fruit for God. You see, we have something better than the law. We have the gospel. We have something better someone better than the law, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And as God's people, we are not perfect. We still struggle with sin. We're going to see that later on in Romans 7. But we are born of the Spirit. We are, we've been regenerated. We are a new creation in Christ. And so we no longer live in the flesh, but we live in the Spirit. I think John Bunyan best described this in a little poem that he wrote. He said, Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. You see, our new relationship with God has commands in it. When you look at the Bible and you look at the New Testament and the Old Testament, the Old Testament's four times larger than the New Testament, but the New Testament has twice as many commands than the Old Testament. Those are general figures there. But you can count them up if you don't trust me. 
So a lot of times we say, oh, I'm, under, I'm not under the law, so there's no commands, there's no rules for me. That's bogus. When someone says that, you either question their reading comprehension of Romans 7, or you just think they're just trying to ignore it. There, there are rules. It's the relationship to them. We don't use them to earn God's favor. We don't look at God's rules to bear fruit for God. We know the only way we can bear fruit with God is we're united with Christ. We possess His Spirit and that empowers us. That motivates us. That gives us the desire to bear that fruit for God. Before we were Christians, we were spiritual caterpillars and we could not fly. Fly, fly, fly. We can't do it. We don't, we don't have wings. But now we are spiritual butterflies through the metamorphosis of God's grace. And now we can fly because of the wings, the power that God has given to us by His Spirit. And yet we still live between the times. Sometimes we relapse and we forget we have wings. We start thinking we're caterpillars again. We don't always trust in and obey God the way that we should. And so the Lord reminds us of the fundamental truth about us, that we are butterflies. We have a new marriage. We have a new master. We have been baptized with Christ to walk in the newness of His life. That knowledge of the gospel changes us. And we can then obey. We can follow Christ, not because the law tells us to, but because we are empowered by God's grace. We belong to Jesus, who's been raised from the dead. And as a result we ne'er can bear much fruit for God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. We're thankful for the spiritual transformation that takes place in our lives, not because You have given Your commands, but because You have given us Christ. And with Christ, You have given us the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that we would be a people committed to Your rules and to Your commands to bear much fruit for You. But Lord, that we would do that from a right understanding of our relationship to the law and a right relationship with You. Father, help us to walk that tightrope and to be balanced as a church, as a people, to understand our relationship to You, Your Gospel, and to the law. And Father, may we be a people who, who live in great joy, not in despair, And that as a result, Lord, people would see the fruit that we bear. And and Lord, we would give opportunity, be given opportunity to, to point people to the work of Christ, to be able to produce the life that we now live as a result of the power of the cross and not the power of our self will and our ability. Father, we thank you for how you gloriously designed your work in our lives to bring you great praise and great honor and do us much good. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.